everybody to our um, regulatory and compliance committee meeting. Uh, I will kick off with our karakia to start with. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tai. E he aki ana o te atukura, he teo, he huka, he hauhu, te hei mau i ora. So welcome colleagues and staff. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. And um, can I start with the apologies? That we have apologies from the Mayor and Deputy Mayor this morning. Can I have a mover and a seconder? A bit of move, Chair. Yeah. Smith and Busich, thank you. And we don't have any deputations this morning. Um, before we kick into the minutes, I just wanted to um, mention, I mean, a number of you may have received emails from people about the dog fighting incident that happened last month and the concerns from the public that there is a, a ring happening in Northland. Um, it's alleged that the two dogs that um, were found deceased were captured in a video and some people feel they recognise it was in Moetua, um, but the police have to investigate that. That's not for council to investigate. Um, staff have put a web page up on the website um, talking about you know, the legalities behind dog fighting um, and we've also got a dog registration campaign to start and we're going to work to include some information around um, stray dogs, illegal dog fighting as well. But if people know of this happening, they should report it to the police. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what I was... And, and I just wanted to... Um, make sure everybody knows that council animal management staff are working with the um, authorities and the dog people as 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 we can whenever we have information. Yeah. So on to the minutes. Or did you have anything you needed to say? Okay, cool. All right. Confirmation of previous minutes. I'll move the minutes as true and correct record. Does anybody want to second that? Yeah, second. Thank you, Councillor Collard. Any matters arising from these minutes? Hold it. All those in favour? Thank you. And so we have up next our first information report of the day. And the recommendation is that the Regulatory Compliance Committee receive the report alcohol licensing update. A bit of move, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Smith. A bit of secondary And Councillor Research. Uh, Rochelle, did you want to <laughs> speak to the <laughs> Whoops, we should have got that read before you, eh? Oh, good. I did see that in the to Darling. Awesome. Thank you. We're in your hands. One second. Okay. Good um, so uh, first report I take is read, so I'll just give a brief um, summary. So the report is for the period of um, 1 November 2021 to 31st of April. Um, actually, I think it's the 30th of April, isn't it? 30 days in April. Um, which is the, the time since the last report. Uh, during that time, there's been a total of 84 alcohol um, licences issued. Um, this is 53 less um, for the same period last year, and this reduction is largely due to the um, less special licences. 
Um, there were a total of 24 special licenses that were applied um, between this period, compared to 57 for the same period last year. So it's really just due to the COVID uncertainties and not holding as many events and everything like that. There have been uh, 54 new or renewed licenses compared to 62 for the same period last year. And a total of 188 manager certificates were issued compared to 157 for the same period last year. And of the manager certificates, 66 were new and 122 were renewed. So, In terms of those special licenses you just spoke of, do we know um, how many that were applied for and not progressed because of the of cancellation of those um, I haven't got those figures, but I would say there's probably, from the ones that I've had across my table, usually we will um, refund or we'll reallocate um, those fees. Um, if it is due to COVID, so usually we don't refund the fees. Um, but I would say that there's probably about um, that have been actually applied for and have been cancelled, um, or we've reallocated the funds to another event, um, would be around 10. Um, the Waipapa application, which has been controversial, but we, has that been scheduled for year in yet, or what's the status of it? Mm -hmm. That's right behind the BP that's sort of covered. Yes, so there has been um, 20 objections received against that application, and um, that will be heard at a DLC hearing, but the um, date hasn't been set this year. Gotcha. That's right. Um, so there have been, uh, for, for this period, there has been um, no DLC hearings. However, we have got this one coming up, the um, the white paper. And yeah, so there is 20 um, applications against that. So we're still waiting for the reports from the Ministry of Health and the Police. Um, and once we have those, um, the inspector's report will get done and then we'll go through to the DLC. <clears throat> In terms of those uh, waiting for the, the health report, is there a, a time frame attached to that? Or it's just when it turns up? This year. Um, that will be through by um, next week. Um, the Ministry of Health will have that through next week. Place will have that, and then once that those are through, the inspectors' reports will get through. So, and then the hearing will be set. So the people will be aware of that of the time frame. Yes. Can I just um, add also with the COVID, there's they've got an extended period of time to respond with officers such as police and Ministry of Health. I just, just wanted to ask, in relation to the postponement, is it an easy process for the applicant to actually transfer them, or is it based on, on like, is it a time frame on how long that special licence is valid for? We've had a number of um, events that have actually been postponed. I'm not sure the percentage of those that actually um, require an alcohol licence, but just in relation to having to re-notify and, and the public awareness, uh, what is the process around that time frame? Um, so there is, with any special licence um, application, it says that the fee is non-refundable, but because of the COVID um, disruption and everything like that, we have treated those on a case-by-case -case basis. 
and it's if those um, event holders actually write in to council to um, request a um, refund or to ask for it to be transferred over to another one, um, that's there is kind of no time frame, but usually that's quite quick um, because they have had this event and then they've cancelled it, so they let us know. Um, so it's really up to uh, the event organiser to get in touch with us and advise that they're either wanting to request a refund or change it, you know, put that money towards a different event. So from the community perspective, sorry, I'm thinking more of the process, the time frame. Does it have to be re-notified so that the community is aware that, that alcohol is attached to that event and it's no longer happening now, it's happening in six weeks' time or seven weeks' time. Yes, it would need to because it would have a different date. Great. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, more just a, a comment from a comms perspective. I dived into the, the website and noticed that we have an alcohol licence public notices page, but it actually contains all of the public notices for our council, so it would be great just to get that tidied up, whether it's a public notices page or we have two separate pages, but it's quite confusing. And I think just to perhaps build on that, especially on the back of the uh, Waipapa situation that we saw, it would be great to have somebody just look over and ensure that from a subscription point of view, we've got that process accessible. Uh, alcohol licensing is obviously quite um, high in the community's interest in some cases. So it would be great just to ensure that we're empowering the ability to have that public voice. Um, and I think that, that just a quick review of that website page would be really beneficial. Thank you. Yeah. Madam Chair, just in relation Hi. to the community and the public in general, um, is there any way that the community board can be captured in the link of those notifications of the public notices? Otherwise, it's up to us to actually constantly be searching that site or that section on council's website so that we're made aware if we don't actually pick up on the public notifications. How are community board members finding out about resource consents now? You have to go online and search. They, um, some have been coming through okay. to the individual representatives of the subdivision area. Uh, I have received complaints that they're not being received. So uh, I think that's more around um, actual um, requirements for notification rather than good manners. Yeah, I, I would really appreciate it if Dean and Rochelle, if you could investigate, um, you know, having the alcohol license link sent to the relevant community board in the future because, um, yeah, it is another way also of letting the public know what's happening, you know, spreading the word on their public notice. Elected members, um, Madam Chair, not only community board members. Uh, community board members. members, yeah. And it could go to the chair to be disseminated. <laughs> Madam Chair, Thank just... Um, at the risk of diving into the weeds, if there was a subscription ability within the website and community boards could just subscribe to that as well as general public, which would make the process oh, very wow. streamlined and clean. Awesome. Madam, Madam Chair, we'll follow that up with comments. Community members would like that too, yes. Awesome. Thank you very much, Councillor Smith. Just please please award. Okay. You continue, Rochelle. Well, have you got a question? Oh, no, 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 Thanks, sweet. Thank you. And the last slide is just really um, some examples of uh, trying to improve our communication out to um, business holders or alcohol license holders and everything like that. So there has uh, the winter um, edition is just about due to go out. Um, and so this is the summer and autumn. Um, and we contact local businesses who are happy for us to take photos and actually be a part of these newsletters. So. Oh. Um, yes. How does how does this go out? Is this digital or hard copy? Through the chair. Uh, this is digital, so it goes out to all um, the business holders that we do have on um, file. But we also have um, print off copies, which the um, when the inspectors go through the premises, they'll drop them off to um, the businesses. And they're also available um, at the service centres. Thank you. I think that it is um, important that the hard copies does end up in, uh, in their hands so that they have got a 
recall perhaps or a reference point that can be hanging on the wall wherever it is they want to go. Not all of them are um, digitally minded, some of them are still like me. Any other questions on the alcohol licensing report? All right. All those in favour of receiving it? I forgot to do that. No. Aye. 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 Okay, next item on our agenda. Uh, that the Regulatory Compliance Committee received the report Environmental Health Services Food Licensing Update. Councillor Collard, no reward. Okay. All those in favour? Aye. Okay. We're, did you want to talk to this one as well, Rochelle, before the question? Yeah. Okay. Oh. One second, Rochelle. We're going too fast. was on the back of the other one. Oh, apologies. has been read, so this is just some summary uh, slides. Um, so for the, as of 30th of April, next slide, please. Um, we have 482 food premises registered in the district. Um, this is actually six more um, premises than reported in the previous committee um, report. Um, so COVID-related uncertainties and lower visitor numbers doesn't appear to have had an effect on the number of um, businesses registered this, um, at this stage. Uh, so between... When you look at the 500 million businesses um, that are currently registered, is there any indication that they're all open? Through the chair. So these are all um, currently registered with us, so I wouldn't be able to say whether or not they're currently operating at all, but they have renewed their, their licenses or they've been verified. Just um, the, the reason for the, for the question is that perhaps the uh, impact of COVID is in amongst that registration and not seen uh, at this level. Uh, so between the 1st of November and the 30th of April, there have been 166 verifications. Um, there have been some challenges with COVID uh, for scheduling verifications, so we'll schedule them ahead and often um, the operator's availability due to isolating or confirmed cases has um, prevented us from actually going and doing those verifications, so the businesses have been closed for a certain period of time. 155 of the verifications had an acceptable outcome and 11 had an unacceptable outcome. Um, of all those 11 um, outcomes, the operators were willing and able to comply with no immediate risk to public health, so they were easy, quick fixes. Um, if there is an unacceptable outcome, the period between verifications shortens, so it does increase the running cost for the operator, so um, having a acceptable outcome is very beneficial. So between 1st of November and 30th of April, uh, there have been 17 complaints received via the um, request for service platform. All the complaints received were investigated and the VAVE model uh, was um, followed. And in all instances, the environmental health team have been able to actively work um, with the operators to achieve positive outcomes. 
Um, if there's complaints regarding staff, which is in there, um, that's usually around the operator not being satisfied uh, with the relevant staff member um, around having to improve different parts of their business and operating. So in February, the um, Food Verification Agency underwent a remote surveillance assessment by JASANS um, on behalf of the MPI, and that's to ensure that the requirements of the agency were being met. And it was recommended that we continue to meet the requirements of the recognised agency to conduct verification services under the Food Act. So, that's good. And as mentioned before, there has um, not been an impact on the number of registrations that we hold uh, with the council, um, yeah, with a slight increase, but it has definitely caused disruptions um, for the food businesses as well as um, food verification um, authority. So um, many registered businesses have faced um, shortages in staff and the ability to operate due to staff um, isolating and testing positive for COVID. And um, the environmental health team has now also successfully published two, um, nearly three quarterly food business newsletters. Uh, these are emailed out to registered food operators and also placed on the uh, FMDC website. And um, there's also, again, when the food verifiers go through to the businesses, they do give out hard copies. Uh, so the purpose of these new senators, as well as the alcohol ones, is um, to circulate important messages um, in relation to food registration requirements or practices. Very good. Thank you, Rochelle. Any questions? Um, just, just a quick question. Given that they're renewing their licences, I would assume that there is, wouldn't be any backlog. Should, um, you're not expecting to come the next season, so to speak, I'm hoping that cable will go away and that um, shops will be open and tourists will open. So just looking at trends, would there be any pressure on staff to do curious inspections or not? Uh, not to do that? Uh, we do have a um, slight, well, a, quite a high number to get through by the end of the year due to when we were in level four and level three, um, that they had an extension of time, so those have kind of um, moved forward. Uh, and also, as mentioned, a lot of the you know, civil businesses haven't been able to have those verifications, and so they get pushed out until they are able to open if they are isolating and having to close the business and things like that. So we are slightly behind to where we should be for those, for those reasons, but we are um, managing. In, in the case of um, renewals, it would be if, if you are behind with those, it, it, would it be correct to say that they are deemed to have that license until such a time as they don't, even though you are late? Through the chair. So the verifications are separate to the renewals. So the onus is on the um, customer to, to ensure that their business um, has been renewed and the verifications are when the inspector goes through to those premises to make sure that those um, are, you know, that the practices are compliant and everything like that. So the renewals shouldn't be behind because it's um, the reminders go out and business owners are to renew their registration. Um, so the, the verifications will happen at a separate time. I, the reason why I asked that question is that I have had one or two in the past six months, saying my license has expired and hasn't, new one hasn't turned up, even though I paid the fee and did the renewal on time. So, in terms of where I have my past experiences, that you are deemed to have it until such a time as it's declined. And that could be two weeks, say it's up two weeks after the, after the expiry of the license you have in hand. So yeah, so a licence, uh, so a registration needs to be renewed while it is still active. Um, if there is any delay, um, yeah, that's, that's certainly um, something for us to be made aware of. So I'd appreciate it if anyone is 
hasn't got their registration renewal and they've actually paid their fee within time with the um, interested. Perhaps, Madam Chair, just yes. email those examples through to us. Yes. Yeah, and we'll follow that. Yeah, they the, the, the give the was the time that they were open with an expired license on the door and then you won't be able to show Are you talking about food license? Um, liquor and all food. Oh. Both birds being the same way. Yeah. Um, I noticed on the website that there's an, a flyer for temporary food stores. Um, but are we changing the application form for, um, so I can't find it now, but when I was reading this report, the things that I get coming to me are people doing stalls, you know, like less than, is it less than 20 a year, you, and certain types of food that you're selling, you don't need to have a food control plan, you're exempt. But the application form doesn't give you a space to write, I'm exempt. So unless you know, so you know by exploring the MPI website, um, you can fill out that you're exempt on that form, I think it might be creating a little bit more work for you know, community groups think, and them thinking, oh my gosh, I have to do all this stuff, when they actually just they, they just need to practice good food hygiene and, you know, gloves and temperatures and be careful what's, what food they are selling and for how long. Yeah. Thank you. We'll um, make sure that that's clear. So these are t um, community groups that are doing less than, you know, for fundraising and everything like that. So yeah, yeah. We'll make that clear on the website. Okay. But I really like the, um, there's a, Minimum, minimum standards for the operation of a temporary food store. It's a picture and it's really cool. Yeah. It's awesome. It would be good if it coincided with what the application was. That's all I had on that item. Anybody else have anything more on this? No? Okay. Oh, I, I said all those in favour for that one, don't mm -hmm. I? Okay, cool. okay, item. Thank you, Rochelle. Yeah, thank you, Rochelle. Item 5.3, we've got um, Trent Blakeman on teams. I'm not sure if he's presenting or doing questions. Um, so the recommendation is that the Regulatory Compliance Committee receive the report Building Services BCA update. Happy to move, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Vesich has the seconder. All those in favour? Thank you. Um, Trent. How do you want to do this today? Good morning, Madam Chair. Um, I guess if Marlena was to put the slides up, we can just talk through them. I guess at the end of the day, um, has anyone looked at the slides as well as the report? Because if they have done, we could probably jump straight to just questions if you like. Okay, anybody have any questions? I, I, I do, Trent. Hello, you know, Trent. Um, the question in terms of trends, in fact, I like this report because you do have trends in which is quite good. In fact, the previous two reports must have trends in that as well. But just um, given the pressures of COVID and the building uh, numbers, have been interesting. Um, but there is also the, the spectre of uh, a general downturn. What is your expectation, expectation coming up? Are you going to likely, you know, I know that's a pretty hard question, are you going to see a, a big demand or, or is it going to drop? And, um, I suppose that's a complete guess. I mean, I'm maybe looking at crystal ball and I look at you asking for that answer, but um, what, what are your thoughts on the way it's going to go? Uh, through the chair, you look, I, I guess you're right. Everything out there is telling us that we're heading towards a downturn. I think there's going to be a lag for us, though. Um, that lag presents itself in that, you know, for the last two years, we've issued, I think it's 16 to between 16 and 1800 consents. With those come the inspections once we've issued. So it takes probably anywhere from a year for it 
two years for someone to go through their project, depending on the size. So even if we, say, had a downturn this coming financial year, the reality is the work that's already in the tube would keep us going for probably potentially two years still. You add on top of that the delays in actually getting material so people can complete their builds, that could push it out even further. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely crystal ball gazing stuff. No one really knows what's going to happen, but I think we can all probably agree that some sort of downturn is coming one way or another. And Chair, Trent and I have discussed this in terms of a downturn. Uh, it's a question of by how much you know, will we see a downturn and when. Um, Trent will, and we'll talk a bit later about consents generally, resource, both resource and building consents. Um, the flow on effect of subdivisions um, and the high volumes we're seeing on resource consents through to building albeit that we have building shortages, building material shortages, et cetera, and um, builders um, you know, also in, in, in short supply, on high demand and short supply. Uh, very hard to predict, very hard to predict, but we certainly don't want to get caught out. Um, Trent will probably talk about vacancies and some of the challenges we're experiencing in, in the, on the inspection side of things at the moment. Um, we certainly don't want to be in a position where the BCA is back where it was a few years ago. We, we, we're tracking quite nicely at the moment within the 20-day timeframes. Inspections are an exception to that at the moment, and Trent will expand on that. Uh, but we, we, want to, we want to maintain a position where we stay on top of things. We have an audit coming in um, October, an IANS audit, external audit that um, is done every other year, and we, we want to be as, you know, well prepared as we can be for for that audit, um, but not only for audit purposes, just to have that sense of um, being in, in control of, of the situation going forward. We are seeing building officers, planners, engineers, um, in, in, those are high demand roles uh, in the marketplace outside, and we are losing people, or we run the, the risk of losing people to other entities, um, and, you know, through the private sector, to establishments like Kaying Aura, they've already taken a few building offices. Um, so we really need to ensure that we are um, competitive, and that is something that uh, Trent, you might want to expand on this. But we are looking both in the resource and building consent areas. We're looking to ways of attracting and retaining staff, because when we lose staff, there's a gap. And it's a very difficult gap to fill, and there's a there's, there's a there's a gap um, in, the, in the training um, time that it takes to bring someone up to speed, and then continue at the same level. So I'll, I'll stop there, Madam Chair. I just wanted to highlight that very difficult to have. We don't have a crystal ball, but we have to plan as best we can with what we know and anticipate that if the volume is there at a significant level, that we need to. Um, be ready for it. Thank you, Dan. Uh, anybody else have any questions on building consents? Compliance, okay. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Smith. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I wasn't sure if it was um, relatable to this topic or not, but I'm just going to ask it. Hi, Trent. Nice to see you. Hey, um, we've had a lot of chatter around changes to building code requirements or potential changes to building code requirements and the impact that that is going to have on the general Joe blocks being able to build uh, and live in a home. Um, my question is around whether or not there is a place for our organisation to be having a voice in those processes or not. Uh, I'm not sure if that is entirely uh, suitable or whether that's more of a political field. I'd just like some clarity because I notice that there's plenty of consultation coming up. We do make submissions from time to time as an organisation and I'm just wondering if this is a space that we should be exercising uh, a voice a bit more or not. Um, through the Chair, yeah, look, Councillor Smith, it's, there's always the opportunity either as a, as a council local body, being the BCA or just the council in general, to make submissions to any changes to legislation. Um, the big one on the, on the table at the moment is H1, which they're currently consulting to delay until May 2023, I think it is. Um, that's going to make a, put a lot of expense into building. Um, the theory is, though, it's going to 
have energy savings. That's why they've done it. I can only hope that someone up there has done all the calculations and made it correct. The tough thing for us in Northland is you've got to wonder how us putting in the insulation for somewhere like in the Cargill is going to be beneficial to us, you know, if you if you put that against the expense of it. So we're yet to, um, we're yet to understand what that looks like for us here, up here in the far north. In the past, we've had a far north method, which has allowed us to install a lesser degree of insulation that was more suitable for our climate, but that hasn't happened this time around. So, yeah, we'll just, we'll just have to wait and see on that. So, yeah, any, any other consultations that are coming up? Um, individually as a BCA, we look at those and see if we can put any guidance in that that's typical for our area up here. But as a council, by all means, feel free to um, put your two cents in. Thank you, Trent. That's appreciated. Madam Chair, perhaps just flagging the importance to have our local voice in those processes. And I think Trent's just highlighted a really good uh, example of what happens when that's not strong enough. So I think now more than ever, we need to make sure that we are exercising that ability. We have put some really great submissions forward in the last two years. So I think that perhaps this is a space that as a council, we might like to explore. Um, maybe I will leave that in your hands as the chair, but happy to support as the chair of Stratton Poll. Thank you. Um, Member Ward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, hi, Trent. Just following on from that, um, with rising interest rates and looking at increased um, added costs to the bill, is there any way that um, that we capture the, and it may be that I just have, it's not here, but it may be just that I'm not aware of it, that we actually can have some recording on capturing the, the value of the bill so that we can see where we're going in the field of affordability, bearing in mind that, that banks have tightened up and now there's this increased cost. Um, if we're going to provide and focus on affordable housing moving forward and, and assist in the crisis, is, is that captured and is that information publicly, can it be publicly available so that we, we know, you know, even areas, subdivision, maybe the three um, ward areas would be helpful? Through the Chair, uh, Councillor Ward, yes, look, I can, I have a report that goes to, where does that go to, MB, I believe. And what it does is it talks about the value of the build, how many fees are paid, and I believe I can break it down by ward as well. Um, so look, I can add that information to the next report if you like. We do it every month, so I guess I can pull out, I'll just pull the information between each meeting or something to that effect, um, and then you can have a look at it. Maybe there's a way I can provide that report monthly, because we do it monthly. Um, I could talk to Dean and through the chair we could possibly look at sharing that information. It is public information, so I see no problem with actually providing that. Thank you. Just, I think it would be really beneficial with our moving forward with our spatial planning and just seeing where growth is and it will, it will give us a bit of an insight in, into perhaps, you know, population shifts and the number of people in certain areas. I think it would be really helpful information for us. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, just that's an interesting question. Just to elaborate, does that mean you can identify the cost of individual house bills, or is it more of a generic? Um, when you talk about value of the bill, what does that encompass? Because I'm just thinking there's probably some commercial sensitivity around some of that too. Um, through the chair, so what it would be, I, I basically can break it down into six categories. That's res one, res two, res three, com one, com two, com three, and I can give the project values. It, Although it does go down to an individual project value, which is provided by the person who's applying for the building consent, I wouldn't go to that much detail. I would just leave it in a broad statement by area where the residential building is taking place and the value of it, and where the commercial builds are taking place and the value of it. I have done it before, and it, it's look, it's an interesting read, it really is. And I think it'll provide the information that council is looking for. Thank you. Compliance Company see the report District Services Monthly Business Report for April 2022. Good move, Councillor Smith, Councillor Clinton. 
All those in favour? Thank you. Um, so, I'm sure that there's lots of questions. Excuse me, Madam Chair, did we vote on the last item? Oh, yes, we did. We're happy to take questions, and particularly in particular the regulatory areas. Mm -hmm. There is a monthly business report that does um, also include community and customer services information. Yeah. Um, and, and there's also a lag, so this is April information. Rochelle would um, like to expand on some of the developments within resource consents, just an update um, mm -hmm. for your benefit. Yeah. Uh, but happy to take any questions. Okay. And, um, Trent's still there. Um, any questions on building uh, project compliance for the uh, environmental services side of things? Okay, shall we kick off with questions first or let Rochelle do an update first? Rochelle first. Update first? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> You're all yours, Rochelle. So as Dean mentioned, this was the district services report is for April. So I've taken the liberty of updating for resource consents to the end of May. Um, so as you can see, um, the high number of applications um, is still continuing. There was 174 um, applications received in May. Uh, so that's um, very easily seen to be a the highest in five years from that graph. <clears throat> um, so this is um, at the 3rd of June, um, last Friday, and is subject to change due to some objections or corrections um, that may come through. <clears throat> but as you can see, the uh, statutory time frame has dropped down to around 11%. Um, and there's also a change to last the last months, November and December and April's, as um, statutory compliance, the numbers have changed from what you may have seen earlier, as three applications had a section 37 applied in error and have been corrected in the main report. So that's why it's uh, shown a bit of a change. The, um, the compliance is really uh, due to the applications that are kind of coming through now. We've been able to allocate um, a lot more out by using consultants and so they're starting to come back through, uh, which is kind of, you know, obviously a lot of those have got, um, have already gone over time frames um, and it's, it's really around where they are. So we are able to allocate um, a number to, as we've got um, a, a large number of new grads available to us, we're able to take some of the low complex one. So we're actually getting quite a few low complex ones allocated within time frame. So it's just really when they're coming through. So um, it's uh, this. Oh, sorry. The final. If we go back, Malima. Um, this is the top green line is the um, total number of um, applications that are still actioned and within our system. Um, <clears throat> so this includes the unallocated and the um, ones on suspension as well as the ones that are currently being processed. Um, so as you can see, there's, there's about 800 and nearly 900 within the system. Thank you. Um, yes, we obviously have a problem with resource consents with uh, despite the staff through best efforts, there are staff shortages and that will be replacing. Um, just became aware recently of um, some applicants endeavouring to jump the queue by various means, including sadly our own CCO. That was rejected, which was the appropriate course. But I just wonder, just for the record, is it clear that um, applications are being allocated, allocated in the order in which they are received, so there's no fear or favour to any large or small? Uh, generally, yes. Uh, Rochelle, you might want to expand on that through you, Madam Chair. Um, the triaging system that, that's been in, introduced does vary slightly from that, but Rochelle can explain how that works. So generally it is, um, the triaging is based on 
the application and who we actually have the capacity to um, allocate those applications out. As I mentioned earlier, we do have, um, through consultants and internally, we have a high number of um, new grads that are able to do the lower complex ones. So the lower complex ones are still triaged, um, as in first, first, um, first off, um, but they may go through quicker because there is that capacity for those new, um, those lower complex ones to get done earlier. Where there is a, um, a lack, uh, both internally and externally, is the more senior and intermediate planners for those high complex um, applications. And so they may take a bit, bit longer, but it is still around um, who has been waiting the longest comes through. Uh, the only real exceptions to that is if there is um, a health and safety risk or um, of community benefit. So um, one exception would be around uh, the rural connectivity group where um, getting the cell phone out to it was, um, they still had to wait a long time, don't get me wrong, but um, it's around um, getting, um, if, if there is any community benefit that well, other than that, it's around really triaging and around what um, capacity there is um, of the, the planners. Madam Chair, just an example, I think that uh, Councillor Blendon is referring to not just queue jumping, but where consultant planner A contacts consultant planner B, mm -hmm. who happens to have capacity, and then sets something up on the expectation that council will use plan, uh, consultant planner B to process for council. We can't do that because on a shoulder tapping basis, um, we, we can use extra capacity. So what we would say is consultant planner B is welcome to work with us, but then comes into the pool of resources that we allocate rather than allowing some private behind the scenes arrangements to, to be put in place. Because ultimately, council is, is accountable and responsible for what happens, and um, that just becomes very messy if, if you were to entertain ideas of you know, deals being done. And by the way, you know, this person will, will uh, process on behalf of council. We just can't operate like that. We've made that very clear to the consultant planners involved, and some of them have gone to great lengths. They've even gone, um, they've hired barristers to represent them, but more so on the proposed district plan issue and, and clarity around what happens uh, when the proposed district plan is notified. Um, do they then operate or do their applications, delayed applications then, are they, will they be assessed on the basis of the operative plan and not the proposed plan? And, and that is the advice with that. Simpson Greeson has given that advice uh, to councils at large that we would process all existing resource consent applications under the operative plan. You could ask, is that not to default, but until you're, there's a tree that after the plan is notified, the draft plan, then you can consider both. Then we would need to consider both, yes, to you, Madam Chair, and that will then have the effect of slowing up the process. So every, every planner, consultant planner would have to look at both. And, and it has the potential to slow things up slightly. So that doesn't help us particularly uh, because it will have a slowing effect here. Yeah. Could that explain some of the, the spike people trying to get in ahead of Trying to get in ahead, yeah, certainly. Yeah. If I may, sorry, just one more question. Um, there is a perception, I don't know how true it is, that where we are farming out applications through necessity, that there's a, sometimes a lack of local knowledge can be problematic when people are processing consents for an area which they may know really well. Is that the real problem or issue? Um, Madam Chair, Rochelle may want to comment on it. it. It could be a problem, but we have, we have ways of managing that. So, Rochelle, do you want to just briefly explain what we're doing to address that? Madam Chair, um, so obviously the consultants that we, uh, well, the majority of the consultants that we are um, allocating out to are sort of Northland based. And I have, we, we have been working on it for some time, but there are, and, you know, because we've had to, um, with the high numbers, we've had to go further afield. Um, but we do have, um, you know, the principal planner who's doing the decisions, the final decisions. 
um, certainly has an overview and has been in the, um, the Northland industry for such a long time. So there is that, um, and all decisions are signed off internally within, within council. Um, they don't, there is a familiarity within the district plan, so you know each consultant is making themselves aware of that. And um, for a new um, consultancy group that we have recently brought on um, board, they um, every one has to have site visits and everything like that. But it's allocating them um, similar consents, um, which we will then provide practice notes and everything like that. So and so it's it's kind of not giving them all different sorts of consents. Um, if they're able to take, um, you know, say ten, we would give them ten of that that similar, um, you know, subdivision, two lot subdivisions and things like that in a certain area. Um, so that it's not as complicated as um, you know the higher uh, multiple breaches so and coastal areas. That part of the Well, we <coughs> acknowledge that we've got a shortage of, of plans. Um, do we anticipate that that is going to continue in the long term? And are we doing planning to do anything about that? Being exactly such great planners. Um, and my thought is in terms of scholarship or uh, determined work periods for uh, helping people get the necessary qualifications in the longer term. Is there, um, you know, are we planning to do anything about the church? Certainly are, Madam Chair, through you. Um, and Rochelle, please elaborate on what I'm about to say. So we're looking at the uh, graduate side of things and the, the feeder system, if you like, within New Zealand. But the reality is that there's a shortfall and we did a presentation to um, members of parliament, um, Willa Jean Prime and Kelvin Davis when they visited um, uh, recently. We've also written through the chief executive to the um, to Minister Parker David Parker to flag the fact that we, uh, and we haven't seen them yet on the green list, the green list um, being the categories of employees or categories of roles um, that are in short supply in New Zealand. We've seen engineers um, specified and unspecified, I think is the category, um, and then we haven't seen planners on that list just yet. So um, we also haven't seen a response from Mr. Parker's office um, where we set out the problem from a, a supply point of view. There's just not enough planners in New Zealand. So if we open the borders, then that's one way of bringing planners into New Zealand. Um, otherwise, it's a poaching game at the moment. Everyone's just taking taking planners off everyone else and paying them more. Um, so that's a real threat uh, for us. But on, to answer the question about the feeder system, we certainly do need to grow our planners. We are bottom heavy at the moment, so we have a lot of graduate planners at the low end, and we need to hold on to them. So, Michelle, I'll stop there, and maybe if you could elaborate on part of our delivery plan addresses, we've been working with uh, people in capability and finance to look at ways of um, doing exactly that. So, I'll, I'll pass to Michelle at this point. Madam Chair. Uh as Dean mentioned, we do have a number of new graduates, and so it's really um, sort of doing uh, stay interviews, I guess, at, with them at the moment around what is, you know, wanting uh, for them to stay with, a, with the council, what can we offer them, everything like that. So often it's for further study uh, so that we can perhaps um, help them with their, their study and training um, and then potentially bonding them with council to stay with us for a period of time, depending on, on that. Um, and it's really what their driver is around um, remaining with, with council, whether or not you know there's market allowances for certain periods of time to remain with council to continue um, with their. But as Dean mentioned, there is a shortage across the country, so there's a number of um, different um, territorial authorities and regions that are struggling at the moment. Um, Environment Canterbury is um, got a high volume of applications being received. Um, HUT, Hut City and Waikato are also struggling to um, get um, staff members to Hello. allocate to. Um, so there is a shortage across the country and it's really around 
um, incentivising and, and um, drawing people to the far north to come and um, work for us. Well, I thought the period of training thought was more about local kids from local schools um, and sponsoring them or uh, offering scholarships to those that are interested in terms of their costs to get the school in. Um, and then the bonding to stay with us for a period of time. Obviously, there's the shortages here. It's going to be here, sorry, no. um, <laughs> It's going to be here for a while, and we need to be proactive about it to make sure that we're going to be looking after our local business, which in this case is, is consents and planning. Through the chair, so we do have a um, well, scholarship fund uh, to um, bring someone through, which is not going to solve our immediate problem because no. that's kind of a four year degree, so it takes some time. We do have a cadet who has been with us um, this year who's um, worked out very, very well. She's very, very competent, and so it's certainly been able to use that. She now has got an interest in planning, and so it's really nurturing her through. Um, who study and everything like that, which we can um, have some scholarship funding towards towards that. Okay, Councillor Smith. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. I can imagine it's not easy to stand there and say that 11 percent is where we're currently sitting. <laughs> uh, just as it's not easy to sit here and digest that, especially seeing it go downhill. So I had a few questions, um, not all on resource consenting, so I'm not sure if they might be for you or for Dean. My first question was around the customer care section of this report, and I'm really mindful that we've got a few different mechanisms going on within our organisation now in terms of measuring customer satisfaction, and RFS measurement is just one of them, but two other examples that are asked nicely in our customer satisfaction survey. I'm just wondering out loud if this report is an opportunity to wrap those different mechanisms together to ensure that we're all singing from the same song sheet. Because I think that we've got three different mechanisms that are potentially telling us three different stories, but we're not using any of those to learn from them. So I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity, especially the Ask Nicely, I'm aware that we've got no governance oversight of what that is looking like. It hasn't really found its home from what I gather. So I think that the Ask Nicely results and also any trends coming through we received the customer satisfaction survey to the Stratton Poll Committee, but we're not measuring what those trends are looking like in those spaces. It's just on that individual survey. So I'm thinking that this might be a really good place to measure those trends or just display those. Uh, so just some feedback on the report. Um, the second one was just around libraries, and I know there's some really cool conversations happening around the future for libraries and the role of the future for local government space. Uh, as always, our libraries team are performing really, really well, but I was just wondering if there was any update on what those conversations are looking like, whether there's anything that we need to be aware of from a governance point of view in terms of a shift in service level or potential shift in service delivery. That would be my next question. Madam Chair, um, on libraries specifically, um, while it's not strictly uh, within the regulatory scheme of things, um, the library team is looking at that future of future libraries um, and they've been workshopping that quite extensively just, just of late. There are also discussions with our Northland um, colleagues. Um, I have to say that it's a little warm at the moment in terms of real interest in Northland libraries as, as an amalgamation or not necessarily an amalgamation, but I know Auckland years ago, prior to, prior to the amalgamation, of the councils coming together as libraries and offering a service around um, a more unified, as you could put the amalgamation word, a more <laughs> aligned <laughs> set of services, so, you know, into library loans and borrowing across Northland, etc. So there's certainly um, discussions along those lines, but not they, they our colleagues to the south they haven't warmed to that. Um, I cite there's a Section 17A review that will come to the Strategy and Policy Committee in August. Um, that work is underway now. Section 17A review will look at all kinds of options, particularly in light of the uh, Visitor Information Network New Zealand um, shift to a tier system, tier one, tier two. And we did report on that a few months ago now, and that is alive and well, that, that new system. We've opted to, as a council, 
you signed off on um, on the option to go to a tier one arrangement for, for pay here, for example, but there are costs attached to that and we wanted to wait await the outcome of the Section 17A review before we went down any particular path. So the options are still there. Um, libraries, um, yes, uh, discussions are alive and well. With the shift in priorities in Council going forward, um, we think that um, libraries will take a bit of a back seat, unfortunately, from a funding point of view. That is your decision as elected members, not ours. But um, if infrastructure is going to receive priority, then we think that we would argue that the social infrastructure, libraries is part of social infrastructure and deserves investment like, uh, like anything else. I know there's a new library on the cards for Kaikoui, and that is certainly a positive, a positive thing. Um, but we think that in the scheme of things going forward, it may be that libraries will be a uh, a lesser consideration, but to, to be determined by elected members. So, Madam Chair, perhaps just in response, and the reason for my question, I'm a bit of a library geek, and I've been doing a lot of travel around New Zealand over the last couple of years, and every time I go to a new place, I make an effort to go and visit their library. And what I've noticed is a trend that libraries are becoming well-being hubs, the community well-being hubs. And a really good example, I visited the new Selwyn District Council in Rolleston just the other week, and they had uh, they had amalgamated, to use a terrible word, um, museum artifacts that were relevant to local history, for example. They had local art on display. They had a lot of technology and innovation within that space. So I think perhaps in response and to perhaps bring the glass back up to half full, I think it's just that the identity of libraries will shift. So I'm just ensuring that we're sort of on the bandwagon of that conversation um, going forward. Uh, just shifting into my resource consenting questions then. 11%, Michelle, what is that costing the ratepayer in terms of fines? Discounts. Discounts. There you go, different, <laughs> different word again. After 30 days, we are necessity discount if we don't have an extension or a legitimate reason to extend to 40 days. But, um, yeah. Uh, through the chair, so um, I haven't got the figures of actually what it's costing. Um, it gets discounted one percent per day, uh, down to fifty uh, to a total of fifty, so it can't be any lower. So basically, um, the revenue that's coming through to council is um, most likely going to be fifty percent lower at this stage, or we'll two to the um, maximum of that. Um, a lot of the applications are also going out to consultants, so that's really cost recoverable rather than um, any revenue generating. So I haven't got the figures through. At currently, um, to this financial year, it's not looking too bad, so it's probably going to push through into the next financial year because we do run, um, you know, by the time we get the income, the cost recovered, it's sort of, you know, another month out. So that is. Um, starting to show, but I haven't got this month's figures for the discounts, but I think we're currently sitting at around 50,000, which is a lot lower than what we were 184 two years ago, and then we dropped to 44, so we're kind of even with last year at this stage, um, but as I said, it will probably flow into next year and have, a, have more of an impact. Madam Chair, um, I might reserve the rest of my questions because I think they were on the basis of that response, but I'm just wondering, Council of Usage was your Chair of Assurance, Risk and Finance hat on, what the role of your committee might be at this point. Um, I think Rochelle has flagged a potential that that will continue to increase. Uh, we are seeing that trend of, of decreasing of statutory or compliance, so I'm just flagging perhaps to you that we might like to do a bit of a deep dive into the risk side of things uh, in this space. Um, I suggest that it's, um, you welcome Rochelle to do an update at your committee on where that discount is sitting. Yes. It's a couple Thank weeks you. away. Um, Madam Chair, there is a report going through on to this. the next um, Risk and Finance Committee Excellent. that Tanya and I have. Um, Perfect. So that's, Madam Chair, more to position resource consenting as one of the um, Council-wide risks, yeah. rather than only at an organisation level, because it does it, it does warrant 
placing it in that top 10 of, of risks for council. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, um, Rochelle has been working with um, Tony Reid, so uh, that report should cover it at, at, at the top. Yeah, it needs to highlight those questions, yeah. as well. That's it's great, thank you. Well, I'll make sure that there's a, um, I don't think the discounts part was within the um, report. We can add that. I remember how horrified elected members were last time when it was heading to the 184 amount. It yeah. It wasn't signalled. I think it's just there's opportunity for a no surprises flagging approach. Uh, and this time, if we can learn anything from last time, uh, that would be great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Uh, Member Ward. Thanks, Madam Chair. I have a few questions. Um, I'll start with Trent in case he needs to get on, but I just. Um, in relation to the, on page 65, the um, building services executive summary, I just wanted to check the Kawakawa community, that 40 million of commercial, was that a typo or is that um, something that... <laughs> I missed that. What page it just it stuck out. out. Um, everything's sort of one million, like two million. Um, I just wondered... Oh, page 65 on, on the printed agenda. Yeah, it didn't, just didn't add up to me, so I just wondered if I didn't add them all up, but is it four million or is it a um, large commercial development? Through the chair, council award, it'll be two with uh, Kaoka Hospital. I'd have to check the figures, probably more likely four million, not 40. But yeah, it was to do with the upgrades at the Kaoka Hospital. Thank you. And my other question in relation to consents and things is around on page 85, there is a number of um, applications received for significant developments um, of particular interest in the Bay Islands Whangarao Ward area um, and a lot of discussion and concern has come around the, uh, the last item in Kitty Kitty, the creation of 56 lots. The subdivision is not the discussion, it's the connectivity issues within the application, the roading issues that have been hotly discussed within the community. Uh, very controversial, and I just wondered, this resource consent did not get circulated and, not, and there was no opportunity from um, community concern, community board level, to actually have a discussion around the connectivity issues. I'm, I myself am not sure whether the roading designations have actually been put in place or whether they, you know, whether they're historical and they just, it hasn't actually just been reiterated in this application. I think these are the sort of things, I just wanted to highlight this as an example of, of how you can actually cause a lot of angst and negativity over something that could end up being a, a fabulous contribution or subdivision development within the community through not um, addressing the, um, the public space issues within the actual, they could end up being private roads. Um, it would indicate to me that they may not be with the linkages that um, have been quoted there. But just some comment, please, on that and where the process is at and, and if there is any opportunity for, to, for involvement or if it's too far down the track, please. Is it, is, it, okay. is it at resource consent stage or building consent stage? I think it's at resource consent stage. Resource consent stage is what's my knowledge. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if we have that detail in handy. Um, Rochelle, unless you have, we can always take that question away and answer that for you, um, yeah. Member Ward. Yeah. Uh, apologies, there's a lot of questions within yeah. the question, but uh, it's getting the big picture stuff together again from you know from a community perspective and community concerns. Um, it, it may be that the uh, that it is compliant in relation to resource consent, but the, the impact on on the community and the general resident and ratepayer is perceived to be greater than an individual subdivision. So if we could have some even if somebody can come to speak to the board, the community board about that, so that we're in a position that we can inform uh, members of the community as to the facts rather than the conjecture around it, depending on where the consent is at, of course. Uh, thank you. Moving on from the building questions, um, the library, I did receive in the, in the Friday notices that there is going to be a discussion around uh, libraries and uh, the future local government I think it was the 27th of June, <coughs> Madam Chair, 4 o'clock, um, 3 o'clock. I, 
I'm actually not available for that, and I think it's a really crucial community um, topic, uh, following on from what Councillor Smith has just been talking about. I'm not as big a library nerd as her, but I, I certainly value the um, the service in, in the hub within our communities, and um, I'm just wondering whether Council will be capturing that um, that online um, workshop or informative session so that we can share that um, at community board level, please. Um, I'm writing it down, Madam Chair, but I'm not familiar with the who's actually presenting it. Um, it's uh, Lyanza. 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 Uh, however the you... libraries, yeah, the yeah. libraries group. It's a panel discussion around the future for local government. I, I'll follow that up with Chris Bigot and see if we can get Thank a you. report. I can, I can um, request my deputy sit in on that, but I think it would be quite informative to be able to have that discussion and distribute it amongst um, all community board members. Thank you. And I think my final question was around, oh, I just have one uh, more of a comment, really. Um, with the All Black uh, pre-training session um, coming to the area um, at the end of this month, uh, there was a request um, submitted uh, from a high power to use the Blair's Low Domain at Taruru for a training session. Um, I'm happy to say that I did receive um, information as chair that the session um, would be taking place. Uh, my immediate response was, was that it's always nice to be part of the process and not after the event, uh, which I have requested previously. The reason being, uh, my first request, I went straight back and said that it's soccer season and has anybody liaised with the Pahi Football Club um, who are regu regular users of the facility over that period of time? The answer came back, yes, that they have actually been involved okay. and notified. Um, Following on from that, um, so it's great that there had been communication with the regular user groups. I think that that's um, that should have happened, and it's great that it did happen. The query around it is um, there was no um, room or opportunity for the community board members um, under our delegation to comment uh, further. And my immediate concerns as a representative in that subdivision area were actually around um, the state of the grounds at that time of the year and the reinstatement of the grounds at that time of the year, which I'm sure uh, would be part of the terms and conditions of use, but particularly car parking at that time of the year with the grounds being soft and wet. So still a bit of work to do in being involved in the, um, the process of um, some of those uh, bookings for events, particularly Thank on you. our reserves. Thanks, Member Ward. So, um, district facility sits with um, Andy's team, but Dean is furiously yeah. taking my that down to pass on to his team. Thank you. And my final um, query was around noise. Uh, seems to be growing. The community board level, it's an issue of topic of discussion that is growing. Mm -hmm. And I feel that some of the issues could actually be mitigated by providing the board with a better breakdown of the areas of complaints and repetitive offenders, not so much individual, but a number of the complaints received, for example, around um, perhaps cumulative effects of, of noise and when a noise uh, complaint is is lodged as an REVS. It's sometimes quite generic. It's not a specific residence. It might be a combination of a number of um, premises. And I think it would be really helpful to have whether they are individual um, addresses, households, or generic complaints. Um, I know I'm, I myself am getting a lot more complaints around noise in relation to cars and motorbikes, which of course, you know, is, is more a police issue and a, and a civil issue. But I just think we really need to start, um, you know, diving a bit deeper into some clarity around what are these growing complaints and, and where are they coming from. Um, it's great to see that we've been met, compliance has been met. Um, 
in the rural areas, but it's the urban areas that are more of a concern. So I'm not sure if I've explained that clearly enough, but it's really to get more clarification around, um, and, and it's people's ability to actually gather information to be able to, to lodge um, formal complaints effectively. Thank you. Mr. Roy so, um, you might need, can we have a chat after? Um, maybe with Rochelle offline, because I, I need to know where you're going. I, mm. I kind of get a sense what people might need to gather that for, but I don't think that that's our role. Uh, but we can talk about it offline. Yes, certainly. I mean, it was really in relation to, to um, areas as, as to whether that, you know, the number of complaints are coming from specific areas, specific streets, perhaps, or townships. It's, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Member Ward. And um, anybody else have any questions off this report? I do. Um, in the report, it's mentioned a couple of times that some tenancies ended, um, and I know this isn't necessarily you guys, but um, do you know if there's a, a trend of once they're leaving, we are um, doing up the property and that's why we're not filling those vacancies? That's another Andy problem. Would you have the answer to that, Andy? So vacancies in the um, housing for the elderly. Yeah. I'm talking about that. So we administer the housing for the elderly. So as far as vacancies are concerned, those are normally noted in the reports. Yeah. The actual reasons behind that, sometimes we do comment on that in terms of uh, refurbishments, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. and things like that. Interest. But yeah, so if there are specific queries, I know there's a very long wait list okay. for these units. All right. And then Obviously, that's a cause for concern for some because they've waited for some time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, often it's the refurbishment and maintenance programs that takes units out for a period and therefore um, until they come back on stream, yeah. um, that would be a cause for some problems. But if there are any specific queries, I mean, I can take those up with Andy. And might, might just need um, a surety that they will let not long after. I mean, this report is yes. a little bit dated. Okay, and my um, other, it's good to see that we are working with the tenants uh, around reducing their debt. Um, I don't understand though how they can get behind because um, if we have a good relationship with the MSD, they can, um, you know, take some of the money and give it directly to us. Um, yeah. Pensioners earn more than the average person. I didn't say that out loud, but I, they do. Um, the um, stray dogs is a real concern in our district, and I've noticed that the RFS is uh, climbing. There's people reporting animals to animal management. Um, it'll be good to do the um, awareness campaign, you know, when we're doing the rego. We've got to change that mindset that you can leave your dog off. Um, it's hard to change behaviours. And I note on in the I just wanted to take this opportunity to check whether cemetery um, allocations are now moving forward during the pandemic. We weren't letting people book allocations, like, you know, they could buy them in advance before the pandemic, but we put it on pause. I noted on the website that the form has gone back up, so to unpause, yeah. it's unpaused. That's fabulous. Not that everyone's dying to die, but um, people do have specific areas that they want to be able to be buried in our communities. Um, and... The other part, I really like that trends section that you've added to this report with the, um, yeah, so talk, looking at um, the resource consenting and adding in those um, specific uh, significant developments is really, I think that's, yeah, 
really helpful for governments. And that's about it. Oh no, I did speak to the, um, the police about the noise control as well. Um, they weren't aware that it was an issue, so um, they took it to the uh, big meeting that was held with the commissioner to make sure that we have um, constables available to go out with our noise control officers for seizures. <coughs> Sure, that's very encouraging. Um, we also have situations, there was one last week where um, our building compliance officers went out to site and were denied access and a neighbour indicated that this person had um, been charged with discharging a firearm and it was known to police. So we, we are having to arrange police escort for um, a lot of our field staff when I say a lot of it, on occasions we need to um, arrange for police escort because um, we flag it in our system as a dangerous address or yep. an address of note because yep. we certainly don't want to be putting our, our um, council officers in harm's way. So there are many examples of that. It's accompanying our noise, uh, contracted noise company um, to go out, particularly at night mm. with noise parties, etc. People have been uh, drinking and doing other things um, to, to then be confronted with people who are very uncooperative. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Okay. It is an ongoing challenge. All right. And I just will, um, under noise, add that I worked across the road from the person in the orchard in Kitty Kitty recently, and I now know why people complain about the gas guns for, you know, when that's. Um, when the fruit's in season and they're trying to keep the birds off the fruit, they're really loud. And when we had people coming through our site, they were really freaked out because of the um, shootings that have been happening in the area. Yeah, so... Oh. So, Madam Chair, yes. uh, was that a real production zone? It was, real <laughs> production. Yes. Yes. Just, just tell the person that this is normal. Well, and it goes off like every 45 minutes, so I, I forget about it myself, my own experience. Um, and then boom, it's off again. I'm like, oh my God, it's only that. It's not a real gun. Don't freak out. Every 45 minutes. Hence the introduction of the horticulture zone in our proposed district plan, Madam Chair. <laughs> yes, that's right. So the proposed district plan has solutions for our for people in our community. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Rochelle and Dean. Um, so, the next item in our agenda is that the Regulatory Compliance Committee received the report action sheet update June 2022. Happy to move through them, Chair. Yep, thank you. We've got Councillor Smith and Deep Search. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. And we are coming to the close of our meeting, but before we do, um, our next meeting is right at the beginning of September. In that um, meeting, I was just talking to Dean about us having a report of our training as a committee, and um, I'm hoping that at that meeting we will um, send a recommendation to um, the incoming council to council that um, they make sure that these the reports or the work program that this committee has overseen continues to appear in some form in the new triennium, just to make sure that that oversight continues. Yeah. Any objections to that? No? Okay. All right. I will close our meeting. Thank you, everybody. Kia tau, kia tato kato, te atapai o tō tato araki, o ihu paraiti, me te aroha, me te atua, me te tifinga tahi tahi, ki te wairua tapu, ake ake, amen. Amen. Thank you.